We've looked at stellar parallax in passing in several episodes, but there have been requests in the comments to look into more detail. Andres asked more than once, and last time he wrote, I told him I'd put it onto my to-do list. So, here we are. When Brett was with us, and I really did appreciate his well-thought-out contributions, he claimed parallax was a key fact in establishing that the Earth travels round the Sun. He told us he was a physics lecturer, and he'd given classes on relativity. I loved his contributions because they gave the consensus in modern physics. I'm sure there'll be many who remember his vigorous defence of Einstein. When I pointed out that for his special theory, Einstein had to deny the ether to make light work the way he wanted it to work. But when he came with general relativity, he admitted... According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable, for in such a space there would be not only no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence for standards of space and time. We kept being told there was no inconsistency, because Einstein decreed that this was a special kind of ether, which didn't influence light at all. The vast majority of modern physicists seem unable to see any of the many inconsistencies in Einstein's relativity. He says that without the ether there would be no propagation of light, and yet in the next breath he arbitrarily decrees that his ether does not influence light at all. There's something quite similar with the claim that stellar parallax proves that the Earth goes round the Sun. The standard story, which is based on Einstein's relativity, assumes a universe created by a Big Bang with vast numbers of stars trailing out into infinite space. Somewhere in this vast mass of trillions of stars, which are expanding away from some kind of centre, is the Sun with the Earth orbiting round it at a speed of about 100,000 kilometres per hour. And that's amazing, since the Big Bang could not have produced angular momentum without a raft of assumptions and mathematics based on them. It can't explain anything whirling around. But the things the establishment tell us get even more amazing. The solar system is orbiting a galaxy of vast numbers of stars at 820,000 kilometres per hour. And the galaxy is orbiting the local cluster of galaxies at over 2 million kilometres an hour. And that is orbiting the local cluster of galaxies at an absolutely mind-boggling speed. If we knew where the central point was, the point where all this whirling was turning about, we might think that that point alone might be stationary. But it would just show that we are not part of the ruling clique of science, which has decreed there is no unique centre of the universe. Using their amazing mathematic, or perhaps their wonderful technicolor mathematics, they tell us with a straight face that the centre of the universe is everywhere, and its edge is nowhere. So you can choose any point you like to be stationary. The Sun is a very popular choice. So despite the establishment's confident assertion that it's spinning and spiralling through space in giddy gyrations at fantastic speed, we are free to consider it stationary, while everything else gyrates madly around it. That's called the general principle of relativity, the principle Einstein relied on for his incredible theory. Well, let's see what stellar parallax tells us in this chosen situation. The Sun is stationary. The Earth goes round it with an orbit of 300 million kilometres 
or 180 million miles in diameter. The stars which appear bright from the Earth must be much nearer than the dim stars beyond them. The very dim stars must be much further away still. So we can use an idea called parallax to measure the distance to the nearby stars. We can illustrate parallax with a tree not very far away and something like a mountain or a church steeple in the background. If we walk roughly perpendicular to the line from the tree to the distant object, we'll leave the tree behind quite quickly, but the distant object will be visible for much longer. We'll still be able to see the mountain when the tree has been left behind. This phenomenon, near objects appearing to move more quickly than distant objects, is called parallax. Now, if we assume that the Earth moves from 150 million kilometres, or 90 million miles, on one side of the Sun, to 90 million miles on the other side of the Sun every six months, and assuming that the faint stars in the background hardly move at all compared to a bright star that we're looking at, it's possible to do some fairly simple trigonometry. Using some angles the astronomer measures with his telescope, to work out how far away a nearby star might be. The apparent change in a star's position relative to the distant stars in the background, the parallax, the change in the measured angle, is tiny. It's usually given in units of milli-arc seconds, which are thousandths of a second of arc. A second of arc is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. And that's a very small angle. The distance to something which has a parallax angle of one arc second is called a parsec. According to current astronomy, a parsec is a distance of 31 trillion kilometres, or 31 times 10 to the 12 kilometres, or 19 trillion miles, or 19 times 10 to the 12 miles. Light travelling at about 3,000 kilometres, or 180,000 miles every second, would take 3.2 years to travel one parsec. The nearest stars are thought to be about twice that distance away. But what would happen if instead of choosing the Sun to be stationary, we choose the Earth? The universe goes around the Earth, since it's just as valid as any other centre. Remember the principle of relativity. If the Earth is stationary, with the Sun and stars going around it, it's just as valid as any other centre. The parallax will be the same. But we can't check that out experimentally. We'd need to take observations from the Sun six months apart. Nobody has ever taken any observations from the Sun, and probably never will. But although we can't actually do that particular check, there seems to be something very wrong with stellar parallax. When the Hubble telescope was launched, there was a lot of talk about how we would get measurements of parallax far more accurately than from Earth-bound telescopes. But instead, we got a trickle of information giving the impression that there was something wrong with the Hubble's parallax measurements. Other space telescopes have been launched and some of them have also been measuring parallax. Let's look in more detail at the research paper which we skated over in episode 71, the paper by Harold Bond et al. in the Astrophysical Journal of January 23rd 2018. Polaris, the nearest and brightest sea feed, is a potential anchor point for the Levitt period luminosity relation. However, its distance is a matter of contention, with the recent advocacy for a parallax of about 10 MAS in contrast with the Hipparchos measurements of 7.54 plus or minus 0.11 milli-arc seconds. We report on an independent trigonometric parallax determination 
using the fine guidance sensors of the Hubble Space Telescope. Our results, 6.26 plus or minus 0.24 milliarc seconds, is even smaller than that found by Hipparchos. Now, the first question to ask is, why was the advocated parallax 10 milliarc seconds? Well, when the paper was written, the Gaia Space Telescope, which had been launched in 2013, and which was claimed to be able to measure far more accurately than anything that had gone before it, was giving that value. But we see that according to the Hipparchos measurement, 7.54 plus or minus 0.11, the parallax can't be greater than 7.65 or smaller than 7.43. The Hubble value is 6.25 plus or minus 0.24. So it can't be greater than 6.49 or less than 6.01, which is completely outside the Hipparchos range of possibilities and a joke compared to the advocated value of 10. What does this tell us about their claimed accuracy of 0.11 or 0.24 milliarc seconds? Could it be that the parallax stories are as doubtful as the other stories which the astronomers have been selling us? as we saw in episode 89. If the parallax measurements had really been taken from points separated by 300 million kilometres, or 180 million miles, the difference in orbital heights of the satellites would have made only a tiny difference, less than 1%. But the Gaia value is 60% greater than the Hubble value. But if the Earth were stationary, then those parallax measurements would have been taken with the baseline locked into the satellite's orbit. So how do the measurements fit in with that possibility? Well, unfortunately, Gaia has a lysergous orbit. It doesn't orbit the Earth. It orbits a point in space known as a Lagrange point. It's an elongated orbit with a length of one direction, 9,000 kilometres, and the other direction, 342,000 kilometres. Lysergous orbits are not very stable, but they need less fuel to maintain than other types of orbits. Unfortunately, it's hard to make a reasonable guess at the baseline used for this measurement. The Hipparchus satellite also has a strange orbit. After one rocket put it in a temporary holding orbit, another rocket was supposed to put it in an almost circular Earth stationary orbit. But the second rocket misbehaved, so Hipparchus ended up in a very elongated elliptical orbit. If we take the average distance from the satellite to the centre of the Earth, or to the Lagrange point for Gaia, we should have a good estimate of the baseline for Hubble, a not so good estimate for Hipparchos, and a fairly questionable estimate for Gaia. The distances will depend on the baseline length. Those assumed baselines give the distance to Polaris, according to Gaia's estimated baseline, of approximately 23 light days, or 6 times 10 to the 11 kilometres. That's a very long way, but very much less than the astronomers tell us. The distance according to the Hipparchos estimated baseline is approximately 7 light days, or 1.8 times 10 to the 11 kilometres. And the distance from Hubble's baseline 2.4 light day, or 6.3 times 10 to the power 10 kilometres. These results are pretty reasonable if the Earth is stationary, and our baseline depends on the size of the satellite's orbit. But they make no sense if the Earth is orbiting the Sun. We might ask, why does it look as if the astronomers keep on getting everything wrong? Simple they have a completely wrong idea of what the universe is like.
But there are two good reasons for not trying to make much more out of these findings than that the distances, the astronomers tell us, are a joke. The first is that the whole story assumes that we are dealing with a Big Bang-type universe. It's far more likely that we're actually dealing with a universe with a completely different form and structure. I suggest it would make far more sense to consider the form and structure described in Genesis chapter 1, the form and structure we looked at in episodes 47 and 48. And the second reason for not trying to make too much out of these findings is that the Bible assures us we will never be able to measure the heavens. We will never be able to make the right assumptions to use any observations to give a correct measure of the heavens. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. And we can be confident that God never will cast off all the seed of Israel in spite of all that they've done in rebelling against him, in giving themselves over to idolatry and trampling on his laws. Because just before this verse, he says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.